Uh, tonight, we'll be talking to Randy Harrington. I've had Randy on the show in the past. I want to say it was like episode 109 and two, 220 something, uh, where he talked about his encounters. But Randy's uh, he's a crazy man. He'll go out there by himself, and he does a lot of cool things. He sets up fake tents. Uh, trying to get them on thermal and just different things to try and trick them. I've never heard of anyone else doing that. Uh, so I'm excited to have uh, Randy Harrington on the show tonight. He'll be talking about his experiences, and it's interesting. I don't know if you guys have heard of the North American Wood Ape Organization, or I'm not sure what they call themselves, but uh, it's down there in Oklahoma, and they are in the process of trying to shoot one. They have been for many years. I say in the process, but many years they've been trying to kill one of these things. And where Randy's getting all of his activity is actually about 20 miles as a crow flies from where he's at. Uh, so we'll be talking about some of that tonight. And then Randy also got a thermal. He hasn't released it yet, but he, he got a thermal on a property. So he'll be talking about that tonight and when it's supposed to be uh, released. If you've had an encounter and you'd like to be on the show, shoot me an email. My email address is wes at sasquatchchronicles.com. If you get a chance to check out sasquatchchronicles.com, you can become a member, get additional shows. Uh, and if you sign up this weekend, I'll see you back on Sunday. Uh, let's jump into it tonight. I want to welcome Randy to the show. Randy, thanks for coming on. Man, I'm glad to be here, Wes. Uh, I'm following your your podcast, and I'm really happy to be a part of it. No, I'm happy to have you on, and I've been following you for a long time. And Randy, what episodes were you on? 190, and do you remember that one? 109. So I was way back in the beginning. 109 <laughs> and 225. 109 and 225. So if you want to hear about Randy's encounters. Uh, but tonight, Randy's going to be playing, uh, we'll be sharing some of his audio, and we'll be talking about this location he went up, and the... Um, Man, I got to tell you, the uh, that one running past the tent I was just telling you before we went on the air, that, that creeped me out, man. <laughs> that really creeped me out. If you would, tell us the backstory behind all this, because you got the knocks, and I'll play them here in a moment. You got the knocks, you got the uh, the running past the tent, and I know you do a lot of things that a lot, and I want to tell you this, you do a lot of things a lot of Bigfoot researchers, and I, I know sometimes I choke on that word, but you do a lot of things that a lot of people don't do, and you think outside of the box, and I like that. There's been a lot of things that you, you and I have talked about in the past, setting up empty tents and then watching the tents. I mean, just genius type stuff, in my opinion. No one else is doing. You know, most people go out there with a six-pack of beer, sit around a fire and hope for the best. And you actually try and lure them in. You try to try different tricks to get them to come in. Uh, tell us about this location, if you would, Randy. Uh, well, the, the location, if we're going to talk about the tent where they ran by, uh, that's my regular research area down just south of Honubi, Oklahoma. Uh, everybody everybody here probably knows about NAWAC, North American Wood Ape Conservancy. My area is probably 20 air miles from their area X. So I'm probably dealing with some of the same creatures. I gotcha. You know what? Let me play this real quick. Here is an NP tent. You set up a recorder in and something ran ran past it in the middle of the night. Take a listen. And I hope that audio actually translates uh, to podcast format. I hear it pretty clearly in my headphones. Sounds like something running up a uh, gravel road. Uh, but tell us, tell us the backstory. What what was going on here? Well, about ten years ago, and everybody who knows me and people who are my friends knows that I take I take people with me all the time up on that ridge, and we have a basic campsite area where we got the Ridge Walker video and all of these other things have taken place over the years, like the walkie talkie that was returned to us and the rock carn, things like that. This is all on the same Ridge. So I keep going back to the same, same place. I mean, why would I not go back to the same place if this is, is such an active area? Well, anyways, so uh, about 10 years ago, we were there with a group of people and uh, I was on, I had a Polaris Ranger at the time and uh, I told a guy that was with me, we were kind of hanging out together. He was a young man, maybe in his early 20s. And uh, I said, I said, I want to take an empty tent and ride it somewhere up on the ridge and set the tent up. I'd, I'd never done anything like this before. I just want to set it up and put a recorder in the floor of the tent and then we'll just leave it. And then tomorrow I'll go up there, collect the recorder and we'll listen to it and see if anything happens. 
really, it was just an experiment. Well, when I listened to it the next day, it was really telling. It, 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 I catalog what I hear in my head, in the library of my head, so that I can use it against them, you know, as far as behaviors. And so you could hear me leaving the tent and, you know, tootling, tootling away down the mountainside. You can hear the, 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 the Polaris Ranger gradually leave this, the audio sound anyways. So then it's nothing but silent. And uh, about 30 minutes, it, just like clockwork, as, as I've come to, to learn about the area, it takes about 30 or 40 minutes after they think that you've gone into a tent and gone to sleep that they just kind of start working their way in closer and closer. And, and you can actually hear this on, on the recorder. You can hear, you can hear movement, you can hear twigs snapping. And then, then occasionally you'll hear something being thrown at the tent. And you know, sometimes it would hit the tent, sometimes it would miss the tent, but it clearly wasn't anything large, just, just small pebble, pebble like things, but it's the same type of behavior. Well, anyways, in the middle of all this going on, you hear what sounded like something come running towards the tent and just the the feet hitting the ground just bam, 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 and then run right by the tent and you hear it run away as it as it as the sound dissipates as it, as it's running away and it, it's it's almost like it was dared dared to run by the tent as close as it could and that's what happened that, at least that's what it sounded like to me but but granted that happened 10 years ago and I, I've gotten in, involved in a lot of other types of research in the area and had a lot of activity and stuff like that, but I had never set up another empty tent until last year. I was up there by myself and I was just thinking of things to do. You know, activity wasn't very, things weren't happening as, the way I like it. So I was, I was like, man, I've got to do something, at least give me something I can listen to on my uh, recorder the next day. So I, I thought, well, hey, I'll, I'll do the empty tent thing. I haven't done that in a long time. Matter of fact, I'd only done it once. So uh, it had been about 10 years. So I went up on the ridge about a mile past where I was camped, and I set up an empty tent. And this time I put the recorder in the woods behind the tent. So it wasn't actually inside the tent. Well, anyways, I'm telling you, that's what I sent you. Got the exact same thing something ran by the tent and it sounds it sounds like a little like a like it might be a young one yeah i thought the the steps yeah the steps seem really tight yeah i hear you let's take a listen this is the second recording you had Yeah, I know it's not concrete, but it is fascinating. I mean, here's an empty tent in the middle of nowhere with a recorder, and something's obviously running past it. it sounds like it's on two legs. You know, Randy, I get a lot of uh, witnesses I talk to um, where they will be laying in their tent at night, middle of the night, and they'll say something ran past their tent on two legs. They never saw it, but they heard it. Uh, so it's fascinating to me. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, and anyways, so I was, of course, excited about it, and I was thinking to myself, what are the odds, two different scenarios where I set up an empty tent in generally the same area with a 10-year window between the two happenings and have the exact same thing happen? What are the odds? But you're not going to believe this. I took the tent down, moved one ridge over, which is still relatively close to my base camp, but up on another ridge. I set it up in a completely different area and put the recorder by the tent. And the next day, listening to it, the exact same thing happened again. Something ran by it. I, I don't even know. I should have went and bought a lottery ticket because I do not know <laughs> a, a natural occurrence of something that yeah. would do that on three separate occasions in three different places on the same in the same area, unless it's our target species. How would you – yeah, I tend to agree with you. I don't think it's a person. I mean, I think you would have heard a dummy like me talking to someone or possibly hearing me sing or, you know. <laughs> but you don't hear any of that. It's just running. You just hear this thing just running. Um, I wanted to ask you about that behavior. What, what's your take on that behavior? Is it just trying to wakey, wakey, we're here, let's – let's. You know, I don't, I don't think it's any different than 
pebbles being thrown because you know they are certainly capable of throwing rocks the size of bowling balls if they wanted to if they really were trying to get you out of there they'd have no problem throwing something that would completely collapse the tent so, but they refrain from doing that they just seem to be satisfied toying with you so they, they'll throw pebbles i think their curiosity is the mainstay of what they're about, their, their curiosity. And, and over the years, I've gotten a little more comfortable. That's why I'm, I'm comfortable being out there by myself. When I started out, I, I wasn't as comfortable because I had a lot of fear, you know, after I saw that large one. So, and, and with good reason, because you, you don't know what these things were capable of. But when you look at it, he, he could do whatever he wanted to. So, so my fear was, wasn't unfounded, but over time, you know, it's kind of like when I was at the fire department. When you start out at the fire department, the first time you get a call in the middle of the night to go to a fire, man, your heart is racing and, and things are exciting and, and, and you're afraid and you don't know what to expect. But over time, I had so many fires. And so so you learn to just be calm because, it's, you know, you, you know what to expect. There's nothing that's going to happen that you, you haven't seen before. And that's what's happening to me now after 13, 14, 15 years of this type of research with them coming in all the time. I haven't had anything happen. Nothing is, you know, n nothing has tried to scare me. I, I haven't, I haven't smelled one. So I'm, I'm assuming that I'm at least doing enough of the right things where they come in with just a pure curiosity about me. I don't want to initiate the bad smelling one because that tells me that somebody's afraid or somebody has a, a different demeanor being here. And I don't I don't want that demeanor. I, I just want them to be curious about me. No, I understand what you're saying. I, I think it does seem like more of a curiosity, more playful. I'm going to run past the 10. I mean, they're not coming in, like you said, throwing boulders. But I mean, have you gotten any other audio that of them vocalizing Anything terrifying as far as them screaming at you or roaring at you? Or do you find in this area it's mainly playful behavior? Because I find it fascinating because, you, like you said, 20 miles across the way, you got a bunch of guys out there popping shots off at them, trying to kill one, and you might be running into the same group, and they might put you into that same group. So have you experienced any aggression out there? Well, of, of course, I read everything I can that's happening at, at – the North American Wood Ape Conservancy, because it's it's in my area, and I'm certainly curious about what they're doing. They have a lot of activity where rocks are. Be, I mean, you know, Bob Strain, and and they have lots of, I would call, uh, celebrity guests show up there in the from the Bigfoot world that that hang out there with them, like Bob Strain and his wife, uh, and and they all have had interactions there. Some of them have even had sightings. But but most of their activity is just on the hillsides around those cabins and lots of rocks being pelted down at night, hitting those cabin roofs. That just seems to be the mainstay of their activity, just throwing things. So evidently them taking pot, pot shots at them with their guns hasn't deterred them from still coming in, being curious, sticking their hand through a window. I think that's one of the things that happened there. Something stuck his hand through the window and touched somebody while they were in the bed. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, so you would think that the, the taking shots at them should deter that kind of activity, but it doesn't seem to. So, so I don't think that they're coming to me and bringing any uh, anger or animosity because I don't even think they might even un not even understand that they're being shot at. I don't know. You know, they've, they've listened to hunters, for the for a hundred years up in those woods every hunting season shooting all day long and you know and, and even reported you know swiping deer at the humphreys cabin when they were shooting deer off their porch and and not running when they were being shot at because they're just assuming yeah. that they're shooting at the deer i mean so so they may not even understand that they're the ones being shot at and i know randy you do a lot of this stuff alone uh which normally i would disagree with but you know i know you're like ex-firefighter, seven foot tall, 350 pounds of muscle. <laughs> I think you're the only guy in the Bigfoot world that's uh, actually in shape. Uh, but what are you hoping to accomplish with this whole thing? I mean, are you hoping to, and I don't want to diminish what you got, but I mean, are you just hoping to get audio? Are you hoping, what? what is your final goal? What is it you're trying to accomplish? You know, I, I myself am not unlike these creatures. My curiosity is, is so overwhelming at times. I mean, I live and breathe 
for the next time that I can get out into where I know these things are, because I want to, I want to try new things. I want to, I want to see if I can trick them. I, 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 I have tricked them. I know they can be tricked and it is not easy. It is not easy. You really, you really have to have a self-discipline that only few, I've only seen a few times from people. You have to be able to sit silently for hours waiting for them to do it because i'm telling you they are paying attention and if they if they hear even the slightest movement from you it, it, when they think you're you should be asleep they're gone i mean these things are aware of what's going on so my goal i'm really just tenacious about wanting I, I like sharing with people. I, I mean, I like doing this po- podcast. I, I like talking on radio shows. I like sharing what I've got and I love talking about it. And I, and I want to learn from other people. And I really want, I, I just, I just want to get some evidence. That's, I want to get the best evidence that's ever been seen that. And, and I don't know if that I'm sure it's not going to happen, but, uh, but Hey, you've got to have goals. So, so. yeah, no, I like it. I like that. I, I like that attitude. Um, I think you and I talked one time, and you'll have to correct me, Randy. I, I have the memory of like an 80-year-old woman. You were trying to set up a trap one time, didn't you? And it got in the back of your truck or something? Didn't it step up? Like you had set up a tent. Um, and I know you explained the story before, but to explain your tenacity, will you tell that story again? You set up a tent, you sit in your truck, and you're trying to capture this thing on – was it flare or night vision, wasn't it? Right. Well, I – all I had was uh, at the time it was in 2006. I just had a Sony night cam, one of the, that plays on a DVD. So, so it was at the very beginning of my research. So my my equipment was extremely archaic, you know. So, so I had this Sony Vision night shot, and uh, the recorder that I was using that I was recording outside my truck was actually uh, the the miniature cassettes. So it was like 15 minute cassettes that I was having to flip over so, so far away from the kind of equipment that you've got now with digital recorders and things like that, where you can record for 17 hours or 20 hours. I mean, I had, I was having to flip tapes over every 15 minutes. And, and, and even then when I had the the audio, they weren't that good because they were on these little cassette reels. So, so really I, I was ill prepared for what happened that night, even though it was a fantastic night. But yeah, I, I basically just set up a, a campsite. And just like my training from the fire department, I, I, I was cataloging, I was reading everything I could about Bigfoot. And I was, I was meeting with people and finding out that there was stuff going on in this park system. So I really, I really thought, well, what I'll do then, because I, I read a newspaper report where somebody had come in from uh, a movie a few towns away at 10 or 11 o'clock at night into their campsite in, in this Rock Creek area and saw something running from their campsite as they pulled in with their vehicle. So I took that one thing that I read and I developed a whole scenario of what I was going to do based on that because I thought to myself, well, if they think my campsite is empty, then it could be just like that night that those people were gone. And when they came back, it was in their campsite. So, so I need to make it think if it comes around looking around at the campsite, I need to make it think that my campsite is empty because it obviously came into their campsite when they were gone. So I need to, I need them to think I'm gone. So that was, that's what I based that whole night on. I taped blankets up on my windows so that, so that anything in the, in the woods looking through my truck wouldn't see any movement. So there, there were blankets taped up. So really my truck was cocooned off really nicely with blankets. I mean, I could peel them open and look out, you know, at the corners and over my steering wheel if I wanted to. But uh, basically I just sat there in the dark listening with my parabolic uh, from about seven o'clock. And if this was in February, so, you know, it was already starting to get dark at seven o'clock, but by about 10 o'clock or so is when I started hearing my first, footsteps through the park and i mean you're gonna have to go back to episode 109 if you want to hear all of the details but it was yeah it was crazy it ended up jumping on the back of the truck didn't it yeah yeah i mean it's this completely has changed my life i mean everything that i've done since then i've kind of based on the luck that i had that night um you know i do a lot of things out of my truck i stay hidden uh Really? Yeah. Well, I want to ask you about something. You know, I think you're right. I think curiosity is what's going to catch one of these things. 
um, if you can catch one of these things, because sometimes it feels like you're, we're chasing ghosts, doesn't it? I mean, yeah, it feels like we're chasing ghosts. And, um, you know, with this, I, I don't think that they're ghosts, but I, I don't I think they're smarter than people realize. And what I was going to say to you was, why don't you in your tent put food, leave it open and set up a flare? But the problem is, I think and you, and you made a comment earlier that made me really stop and think, you know, they think like we do or they think like you do. And if I saw that, I would immediately think it was a trap. It's some sort of trap. But one thing you should try is if it's your phone, go to YouTube and download Baby Crying. And you can listen to eight hours of a baby crying if you want. Leave it in a tent. I almost wonder if in these areas where you're getting them running past, if you could sit inside your truck far enough away with the FLIR. You'd almost have to put up a garbage bag, though, because I don't know how FLIR works, but I know night vision, it bounces on that glass and so if you're ever inside of a car and you turn on your night vision, it's hard to see anything because when that beam of light hits, it bounces back. And so it just looks like a blurry mess. But I almost wonder if you could sit in there and over one of your windows, like your passenger side window, put up a, you know, a garbage bag, a black garbage bag, because an infrared will see through that garbage bag. I know that for a fact. I've done that personally, and it does see through it. Um, but something like that to catch them coming in, you know, to where... Uh, you know, because you do a video and everyone's going to say it's fake. Go ask Bob Gimlin. Everyone still says that video is fake. And I can just tell you within five minutes of talking to Bob, I can tell you it's not fake. That that actually happened. Um, but, a fl- you know, FLIR video is almost impossible to fake. I mean, really, unless someone's standing there naked and you're still going to know it's a man. But I wonder if have you ever thought of doing something like that to try and trap them coming or sit up on a hill with the FLIR? Man, there is nothing that I haven't done. I mean, I've used all kinds of CD attractants with sounds. I have played CDs of babies crying. I have taken recordings of my own two grandsons. I let them run around the house and they scream and they play. And I recorded the whole thing and I took it up and I played it up in, up in, you know, where I'm at, trying to use it as an attractant to make them think there are two kids with me or whatever. So I've done just about everything. And I'm not saying that those would not be successful. Maybe I didn't have, uh, maybe I didn't do it long enough where I should, you know, maybe I should have done it five nights in a row instead of only one or two nights. But, uh, but yes, I've done just about everything. I've, I've even taken a, <laughs> I've even taken a small generator and a 36 inch TV up on that ridge with me. <laughs> and I played the little rascals all night long up on this huge TV pointing away from my tent in the woods with a, with a night vision camera on top of the TV, looking into the woods. If I ever saw any eyes come up to watch the TV, I mean, I've tried everything. (laughs) Yeah. It's interesting. And that, that episode I sent you with Anthony episode 419, he said the old woman did that. He used to put a TV out there and I hadn't heard that before. So it's interesting that you tried that, but it's so hard. I mean, unless they're in the area and you probably know this better than I do, Randy, but unless they're in the area, it's even then it seems kind of difficult for them to, to attract them to do something for them to come in and check it out. But I think it has to be subtle things, you know, like finding Bigfoot, they blow off fireworks. Well, I'm not going to come in and check, you know, if I was a Sasquatch, I wouldn't go and I'd be like, what the hell are they trying to do? Burn the forest down. Um, But we we, we, we don't, we don't have to argue about finding Bigfoot. No, no, no. no, And I wasn't trying to bat. And I don't want to bash finding Bigfoot because they brought it. But what I'm saying is like, I like the idea they're trying different things, but that one in particular I don't think is going to work. But uh, the baby crying and some of the other things that you've tried, and you've had no success with that, huh? Well, I'm I'm sure I didn't do it long enough. I, I'm sure it may have gotten some interest because it seems like they're inst- interested in just about everything that we do. I just maybe maybe I wasn't patient enough using that media. You know, you know what I'm saying? I'm sure most of that will probably work if you give it enough time. Uh, But there's another thing I'd like to talk about. Um, I know you're going to be at the IBC thing in Kennewick coming up here in a week or so. And uh, there's going to be a gentleman there speaking, giving a presentation, and his name is J.C. Williams. Uh, Last year, I spent some nights with him up near Squaw Spring, up off Kendall Line Drive in uh, the Blue Mountains, and I met up with him again just a few weeks ago. I, I spent some several nights with him up there. <clears throat> nice gentleman. I, I love spending time with him. He's a super intelligent guy. You cut me deep. He didn't even bother calling me when you came to Washington. 
<laughs> I'm just playing with you, man. Sorry to make it off. You know, I, I know, I know. It, it seems like I've, I've got a, a, a set where I want to go and I want to spend some time. And no, and I get I it. Just I'm just playing with you. I'm doing. Well, anyways, so I'm with him and I started out. I spent a couple of nights by Jubilee Lake, which is on the other end of the, uh, the summit there. So I was maybe four or five miles from Jubilee Lake. And, and, I, and I'm telling you, I had a couple of nights where I had some really good recordings where I was hearing things. I was hearing some rock clacks and, and wood knocks. And so then I meet up with, with JC in his spot, which is up by Squaw Spring. And, and I tell him about it. And, and we're there that night. And we get the same thing because the next day I'm listening to my recordings and I got it all on la- laptop where I can go and I can see the spikes where everything sometimes when things happen. So I can just go listen to those spikes and they're tree knocks. And I'm hearing these tree knocks in different locations up on the ridges above us and around us. And he and I are sitting there talking about it. And he says, he says, I'm not, he said, we've got to find out what is causing those that are, that he said, I think there's a natural explanation. He said, I think something's just happening naturally. And I told him, I said, but what you don't understand is, and you don't have the, you don't have the information that I have is the night that I saw the two Bigfoots come into my campsite, one was dragging a stick. So he had a stick in his possession and he was dragging it and he was using it. I said, so I, I don't have to make my imagination go very far to, to know that they use sticks to, to communicate and to hit things, whether they hit tree. Cause like I said, he hit a tree. When I had my encounter, the thing hit a tree and the thing, the other one came across the Creek after he hit the tree and Up to that point, he had never hit the tree the whole time that he was walking through the park. He was hitting the lantern posts. So so he was tapping these lantern posts maybe seven or eight times at different times as he's walking through the park. And not one time when he hit a lantern post did the Bigfoot cross the creek and join him. But the moment he hit that tree when he was behind my truck, he hit it like he was swinging a bat. Pow! And then I heard sloshing coming across the creek. So... I, I think I'm an, an intelligent person. So what I heard was something using a stick like a cell phone where they had a predetermined plan that if I hit a tree, that means you need to get over here because there's something going on. Because every time you'd hit something else, it never crossed the creek. So so I don't need to jump through my imagination to, th- to think of anything else. I know they use sticks and they use them for communication. So I'm up there with J.C. Williams. We're listening. And I'm telling you, we, I probably got 30 or 40 tree knocks throughout the night. You could hear them up on the ridges, pow, and a response. And, you know, and we're close to a spring. So I, I'm thinking maybe they're coming in, you know, to, to drink from the spring water or whatever. And, and, and they're, they're just keeping track of each other where everybody's located. You know, they use a tree knock. But JC and I were talking about it. And he says, I'm not ready to say that that's Bigfoot. He said, because... I'm not ready to admit that there's that many out there because we were hearing a lot. And I told him, I said, well, until I, I said, until it's proven any otherwise to me, that's Bigfoot doing those. And, and here's where it gets amazing. The second or third night, I'm, we're still getting between 30 and 50 knocks a night at different times. And one of those knocks, and, and I sent you the recording it, it was amazing. And when I heard it, I, I, I hollered at JC over at his campsite. And I said, JC, you have got to come over and hear this. And he said, what? I said, it sounds like whatever hit the tree with this stick or bat or whatever, or club, it broke. And, and right when he went, pow, the stick flung around, fell out of its hand and flung around. You could hear it thrashing about as it as it hit either the log or the tree or whatever he was hitting and so I let him listen to it and his eyes got big and he said he said wow he said he said I really got to rethink this because it sounded like something hit and and the stick either broke or it just got jarred out of its hand you know like you know like if you if you use a bat and it jars out of your hand that's what it sounded like to me. And, and, and I caught that on a recording amongst all of those other tree knocks. And I sent it to you and I like it because it just, it's, it's starting to pile on the evidence that that's what I like doing. Yeah. And I apologize to the audience. I don't have that one queued up, but I have this one. That's definitely wood on wood. It's uh, you know, and I don't know that I've ever had someone on the show 
<laughs> you should probably cue the audience. They'll probably know better than I do. I don't know that I've ever had someone on the show that actually saw them with the stick in their hand hitting a tree. I've had reports of them with rocks in their hands smacking trees. I've had reports of them uh, open palm slapping a tree. And people that have actually seen them do it said it sounds a lot like this. And even though you've been out there doing it for a long time, Randy, I mean, I can't imagine sitting in your truck or sitting in your uh, tent and hearing this. What's going through your mind? Well, I was just excited because to me, that validated that there's something up there hitting trees. There's something up there hitting logs or hitting pieces of wood with pieces of wood in order for that sound to happen. It had, it had to have fell out of its hand. And that's, that's how, how it sounded to me. And it, apparently that's how it sounded to JC. And he even told me, because I, I, I told him about my encounter with the two in, in the Chickasaw Park. And he said, Randy, he said, I appreciate you coming up here. He said, just like last year, he said, I get frustrated. He said, I'm, I'm spending a lot of time. He said, I'm not finding any tracks. I'm not finding, you know, much evidence or anything like that. He said, and I'm talking to people that I just really don't trust is telling me the truth about what they either see or, or, and he says, but then here you, here you come along and we've had these discussions and he says, you really got me he said, I, I, I believe you. He said, I believe what you saw in your, in the park. When you tell me your story, he said, you've told it to me twice and the details are exactly the same. He said, and now, you know, we've recorded this stick falling out of something's hand as it was hitting the tree. He said, you've got me re excited that, that there's something going on here and we, we need to get to the bottom of it. So yeah, it is. Feel good. Yeah, no, it is. It is. And that's cool that you take people out. Do you ever go up to the North American wood ape, organization or group or whatever they call themselves I, and I compare emailed, notes and say, I Hey guys, a couple times. I, I emailed them a couple of times uh, and they were supposed to interview me. I told them, I told them since I was in that area anyways, I'd love to be a part of what they're doing, but they never got back with me. Yeah. That's too bad because you guys could really compare notes, you know, Hey, I'm 20 miles this way and I'm getting this. Uh, you think you'd be a gold mine for them, you know, to want to talk to you and find out what, okay, where, where are you at and what's going on? Right. Right. But hey, you know, this leads up to really what I'm here for. And that is this amazing thermal video we just captured probably less than a month ago in Missouri. Yeah. Talk about that, Randy, if you would. Um, I, and for the audience, I don't have a copy of the FLIR video. I know I'm probably going to get emails about why I'm not posting it. I, I don't have a copy of it. But give us a backstory behind the FLIR. What did you guys capture and um, why haven't you released it yet? OK, well, here's what happened. Last year in October, I was down at the Honubby Bigfoot Conference or Festival, uh, and uh, I met a gentleman named Shane Carpenter. Uh, he was there, and he had brought some foot casts that he, some tracks that he had casted on a private, on some private acreage that he was researching in Missouri, and uh, he showed these casts to Meldrum, and. Meldrum got a little excited and uh, he, even though the tracks, it looked like two different tracks to me because one was twisted. Meldrum pointed out how they were probably the same individual because of this characteristic. And Shane says, yes, I believe they are the same. And so right off the bat, Meldrum was like, yeah, th these are authentic and, and here's why. And, and so that was my first, that was my first, uh, meeting with Shane. I, we'd, we'd emailed each other a couple of times. He actually has a YouTube channel called uh, o, Ozark Mountain Sasquatch. He doesn't have too many followers, but but he, he's got some pretty good stuff. Well, anyways, so here's the backstory to that property. Gentleman inherited 400 acres from his family, and uh, there was a special needs family member that lives in a cabin way up on the edge of this property and had, and she's an older woman and she's lived there for years. And so he, he accepted the ownership of this 400 acres, but he goes out there every weekend to take care of her just to make sure that she has a place to live until, you know, until her, her life, you know, reaches its end. So very nice gentleman. He's he's older also, but so it's basically just a place where he'll go on the weekends. Well, he was, he was, he set up a tree stand, to go hunting down there one time 
And he, he was seeing signs that made him think that he had some poachers on the property that he was having to deal with. So he really thought, you know, he was seeing some structures and, you know, some lean tos and things like that. And he, he thought maybe somebody, some people were coming on the property doing some poaching. So he was a little concerned. Well, one time he was moving his tree stand around and he had his own sighting of, of, of a Bigfoot and it really spooked him. So he, he actually had to have, I don't know if it was Shane or somebody else, but he had somebody else go with him to retrieve his tree stand. And now he doesn't go down in, in the bottoms of this property uh, unescorted. Uh, and that's when Shane started researching this property. The gentleman himself, I met him uh, and I talked to him, super nice guy. Even recently, he, he had visitors at his cabin and, and he was talking about how they these these things come up out of the, you know, up in, the woods behind his cabin and he was sitting out front with with some with some guests and rocks come flying over his house and was hitting was landing right and he had to explain to the people what he thought was doing it and of course they vacated real quick and were and were gone uh so so it's it's, it's real active and it, and it's current needless to say shane has been working that area for probably a year or so when i met him last year at honubby and unbeknownst to me is he was actually trying to scope out somebody that can can go can join up with him and help him research the place. I didn't know because he never mentioned anything to me. But later he contacted me and asked me. And, and I mean, I was floored. I, I really appreciate it. Uh, I, I said, absolutely. You know, because it's only about three or four hours from me. So I, I you know, rather than me driving seven hours down into my ridge in Oklahoma, I can only drive four there. So, so yeah, I'd, I'd love to go there. So me, Shane Carpenter, another guy named Chris Reinhardt uh, from Connecticut flew in to, to do this four or five day camping trip with us. And another gentleman named Mark, uh, Mark Gardner, who is a, a friend researcher of Shane's. So all four of us met up there, talked with the owner, and, and we drove down in through the property and went down through some gates and all the way down. I mean, and you definitely needed a four-wheel drive to get down in there and past a creek and, and way down into some areas. And we went ahead and set up a campsite. And here's what I thought would happen. Very active area where you've got some foot tracks and things like that. And, and he even has some pretty decent videos. But uh, but I thought two new guys show up, you know, you know, that scenario, two new guys show up in an area that's active and it's going to be dead. That, that yep. you have to come to expect that. But amazingly, we're down there and we're just setting up campsite. I mean, we're just still kind of piddling around, setting up tents and, and things like that. And Mark went down. There's a creek that runs through the matter of fact, we were close to this creek that runs by us and goes down to a lake. And uh, so he walked through this big grassy field to get down to the lake just to, I think he was actually going to go fishing or something and uh, saw some foot from some footprints right there on the edge of the lake. And so Shane goes down there, and they actually cast a few. And uh, so we're back up at camp talking about, man, how, how awesome is it to, you know, cast some possible tracks right off the bat. And so we were talking about how long we thought it needed to dry before we could go down and, and gather them. Uh, so I think we waited till 11 o'clock. So 11 o'clock at night, you know, it's pitch dark. And I went ahead and set my thermal camera up on a walking stick. And I said, uh, you know, I was going to walk down with them. And I told them, I said, as we're walking through that grassy field, I said, let's stop about every 30, 30 or 40 meters and let me scan around and just see what's going on. And so we were walking and, and I would announce, hey, I'm going to stop. And so everybody would stop. And then I would just look around with my thermal camera. Like the third time we stopped, I start scanning. And I look back towards the creek and I see this head pop up and it's it's bright white and it's round looking up out of the creek. And I go, guys, I said, we got one. Is he's back over? I said, he's in the creek looking at us. I said, come, I said, walk back over here and look at look at the monitor. So they turned around and started coming back towards me. And I'm watching him. And I had already hit record. So I'm recording and I'm watching him. And when they turn around and start heading back towards me, he drops. And I mean he drops fast because because they moved in a way that they spun around and, and would have looked in his direction.
So that so that's what he was aware of, and he dropped. But he didn't drop any further than the grass that he was in. The grass is probably four or five foot tall, and you could see his heat signature just down in the grass. But he just dropped below the grass, and you could see this huge white heat signature in the grass, but he wasn't moving. And I and I said, let's just watch the spot. And here's what we saw. He would go. Yeah, and for the audience, because we're on uh, on a video call, Randy's popping his head above the grass for the audience. Yeah. He yeah. did it like four times, poking his head up and then dropping it back down. And we got that on thermal video. Uh, were you able to were you able to see any details of the face? Because I know sometimes with thermals at a certain distance, the farther you get away from what you're recording, the less the details. And I know that for a fact. Right. Um, right. I recorded a cougar and it was like a big blob. You know what I mean? I knew it was a cougar and I about crapped my pants because the other thing, too, in the thermal people don't realize when you're <laughs> when you actually are looking through that stupid eye hole, things look way closer than what they are. I remember I popped it up one time. I didn't mean to cut you off, Randy. I apologize. I popped it up one time, and I saw like the biggest cougar I'd ever seen in my life. He didn't. He could care less. I was there. He just was walking through, and I about fell over backwards because the thing looked like it was twenty feet away. I'm sure in reality it was probably like eighty feet away. But um, were you able to get any details or anything from the face? Well, su- well, n- not details, but surprisingly, m- my thermal camera is different than any I any I have seen. Ever. Mine isn't the kind you pick up to your eye. Mine is a Pathfinder, which is made for the high-end Cadillacs. So I've got a seven-inch monitor that we can look at, and the camera itself is separate from the monitor. So I, I put it on top of a walking stick. So I can. Oh, spin that's it nice. Yeah. So it's it's really a great thermal, and it allows you to do much more than than you can with the eyepiece ones. So so needless to say, I mean, and I've recorded mountain lion wild pigs, deer. I mean, every animal that you can think of, I've seen with thermal camera. And what's interesting is they're easy to identify. They don't change their behavior. They just keep on walking and sniffing a leaf here and there and do whatever they do. They don't try to hide at all. When you target one of these animals, he is actively trying to hide and that they don't change their behavior from daytime or nighttime. They're still trying to hide and, but the thermal camera catches them anyways. So we were excited and we were thinking, we were debating at the time. I said, well, I said, do we want to send somebody over there where he's at and try to flush him? Or do we want to, we, we didn't want to risk letting him know that we <laughs> send someone over to flush him out. What are you guys drawing straws or what? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I'd be like, you go over there and flush him out. I'll hold the camera. The guy hold the camera didn't have to. Yeah, there you go. But anyways, but 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 we 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 thought about it and we talked about it and I, and I said, well, I said if if he's just watching us, if he's watched you guys track the cast those tracks and that's what he's interested in seeing us do, I said let's just go on down and get the tracks. Let's ignore him and maybe we'll get a better better view and we'll just keep I'll just keep looking for him. So that's what we did. We went down and got the cast and I kept looking back in that direction. I didn't see him anymore. But what we did was eventually we went back to the exact spot where we filmed him and we looked at the monitor and we, we lined up all the trees in the exact spot and we put and we had a man walk over to the exact spot and stand in the exact spot in the grass. And his head looked half as big as the head that was popping up. And when he was over there, he found a huge wallowed out area in the grass uh, where something had been in there and it, and it opened up on the backside at the creek. So, so it was something that would come up out of the creek and wallowed out an area like a, like a grass igloo that was watching us. So, so we got that, that video, and, of course, we were all excited about it. And uh, so we're back at camp, and the next night we go hiking up into the woods. Uh, and uh, as we're walking up through the woods, I mean, these are really thick woods, and I've never been there before, so I really didn't want to get separated from anybody because I didn't want to get lost. But, but uh, so we're – we're all four going up this ridge and uh, a rock gets thrown at us and it happens right to our right as we're going up, as we're going up. So, so it was something that was flanking us to the right. And we actually, I, I, I spun my camera over and was looking and I saw the heat signature of something maybe 50 or 60 or 70 yards sideways behind some trees. And, and again, we had to, we had to discuss it because I thought, 
if we walk over towards it, you run the risk of making him get nervous. And, and, and if he knows that we see him, that changes things. So I said, let's just go on up to where we were heading because we were going to, we were going to go up to where Shane had already gotten a video of one that he calls the, uh, the belly crawler. There was one belly crawling and popping up to look at him as he was walking with his GoPro pointing sideways. <clears throat> so that's where we were heading in the dark. And so we thought, well, we'll just pretend like we don't see it because obviously he's following us, obviously, you know, whatever. So, so we went on up and we, we sat down on this big flat rock that's that at the top of this ridge, but there's still a higher ridge behind us. So I'm sitting down and the, the other guys are with me and I start spinning the camera around and I immediately see about, I don't know, I don't know how far away behind us, something, somebody standing between two trees and it looked like they threw a rock. I saw the arm swing and, and Chris was looking over my shoulder and I thought it was Mark because, so I said, Mark, I said, where are you at? Because I was going to be mad at him for getting too far away from us and, and being goofy. Uh, and Mark immediately just off to my side, he goes, I'm right here. And I go, holy shit. I said, there's one right behind us up on the ridge. And I, I started hitting record and, and Chris, Chris bless his heart was, he was, he's has never seen one. And all of a sudden we've had two nights in a row where we're getting one on thermal video following us around. And he was a nervous wreck. Uh, <clears throat> so, so we got one right up above us, uh, above us. And Shane and I tell Shane and Shane actually stood up out of my view. And when he stood up, this thing, it was bouncing back and forth between two trees. And when Shane stood up, it dropped and it was below the ridge and it dropped. And then it was poking its head up around a tree. You can see his round head poking up around the bottom of the tree where it must have been laying on his belly. Amazing. Just to me, that is amazing behavior captured, and uh, it could be the same one. I don't know. They're how, I can't know what sizes they were, but but they are really good. And Shane uh, has some producer friends there in Missouri that he took it to them, and they really liked it. And they're they're putting them together in in some type of sizzle reel, sizzle reel right now. Gotcha. They're going to try to push it off somewhere. I don't know who, where, or how. But uh, so that's and that's why and, just let them, and that's why you haven't released the video because it's yeah, yeah. I mean, I've got I've got a copy of it on my laptop but I've I've been asked don't send it through the internet to anyone you know no I understand I understand do, that let them it, do what they're going to do with it and yeah but I like it yeah no it sounds fascinating and it it is their behavior and it, it that behavior always fascinates me because I think these things think we can see in the dark. Because I've heard many encounters like that where someone's holding night vision or they're holding FLIR and they see the creature and everyone kind of stops and looks in that direction. And all of a sudden the creature tries to hide because it realizes it's, it's been seen. I don't think they realize we can't see at night for the most part. But un unfortunately, most thermal visions are, are – positioned in a way where you are going to face them if you're looking at them you're going to be facing them and it lights up your face if especially if you've got a monitor that you're looking at so unfortunately to them you are looking at them and so that so they can't know that you can't see in the dark yeah i want to ask you um what, what do you think i ask everyone this question i'll ask you randy what do you think sasquatch is and has your opinion changed since you first got into this oh i'm I, I just think that there's, I think they're just some kind of, uh, I mean, a similar hominid. I mean, just, just like, just like there's 18 different hominids right now. I mean, you know, orangutan, gibbon, gorilla, uh, you know, baboon, us, I mean, all different, all different types that evolved down a different line, but yet we all have some of the, some similar ancestor that branched off and broke into these 18 different hominids. We're just discovering that there's a 19th one that, that branched off somewhere along the line and developed its own way, developed its own, you know, and it may be the, the Neanderthal bones that people, that, that, that the archeologists find, you know, it may not be us at all. Maybe those Neanderthal bones, or Bigfoot bones. I don't know. I mean, I'm, 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 I, who cares what I think? I, I just know that, I mean, really, I can't beat myself up 
trying to think about it too hard. I just, I'm too busy trying to get evidence. And one of these days, maybe we'll have the evidence <laughs> yeah. that we'll sh- tell people what they are and show them. And, and that, that would be enough for me to be, be on the ground floor of being able to be a part of a discovery. I mean, I'm, I'm ate up with it. I mean, it really. Yeah, no, I know you are. And, and you're right. It, I mean, it's hard to say. It's, that's why I like asking that question because there's no wrong answer. No one can give you a wrong answer. I mean, I see people kind of really go off the deep end, tell them like, like, like they think their opinion means a lot. Well, here's what I think it is. And I think this, and you know, well, I read the Bible and I think it's Nephilim and I think this, and I think that don't they know that it really doesn't matter what you think, because that the truth will come out at some point whenever. And, and then the truth will be what it is. It has no, it has your truth has no idea what your opinion is. And sometimes your opinion doesn't matter. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, no, I hear you. It's still it's still kind of fun to guess, you know, what this thing is. And um, you're right. Some sometimes people get so passionate. They're like, God, ah, they're the Nephilim. They're the they're aliens. They're and I always give them the Ron Morehead answer. Yeah, you could be right. You you could be a hundred percent right. You know, because no one you're right. No one knows. And I'm just curious if your opinion of them has changed over the years because you would think we'd be able to catch up with this thing. I mean, really, how intelligent is this thing? It's got an IQ of like 180. No one can catch up with this thing. No one can. Um, but it gets frustrating at times. And, and you know this because you try different techniques. Uh, they're definitely smarter than people think. give them credit for. I think from, from the two thermal videos that we got on two separate nights, I'm starting to see the distance. And, 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 and before we got the thermal video up on the ridge, when he threw the rock, the distance he was away from us. There seems to be a select distance that they're just not comfortable crossing. Every once in a while, you'll catch one on accident. If you step out of your tent and and then you have a close encounter or a hunter has a close encounter, those are all unexpected and certainly not on the, the part of the Bigfoot wanting that to happen. Those are just all pure accidents. But when it's up to them, I think there is a, a select distance that they just won't pass. And And to me... That seems to be about, I don't know, 50 yards, maybe even the distance of a football field. I don't know, but they definitely. No, you're right, because you hear that with a lot of people in their encounters. They'll be like, it was just outside of the firelight or it was just outside of my flashlight or it was just outside of my. And they see like an outline of it or they see um, you're right. They're, they're smart in the sense of where they won't. I don't think they want to be caught in the open. I don't think that they want to be exposed. They want to control the situation and those accidents that happen, like you said, Bob Gimlin and Roger Patterson coming around a corner on horses. Well, that's unexpected, you know, and, or, you know, someone stepping out of their tent. Yeah, that's unexpected. You're going to get something. I think the way to track the, it allows them to control the situation, you know, by keeping a certain distance where they can react. I mean, kind of like the Bigfoot that I saw that no matter there was a table full of food And there was anything else he could have done, but he nervously put himself with the truck between him and my tent, clearly putting a buffer between him and where he would expect someone to be, which is my tent. So those those particular Bigfoots are completely familiarized with campgrounds and where people sleep. So that's how he positioned himself. and And I was able to witness that. So that tells me their thought processes puts them to where they can react and keep themselves under the radar and hidden. So at my campsite, it was my truck. That's what he positioned between him and the tent. Out there, it's distance. They, there's a certain distance that just, they just don't seem to want to cross because they need to have a reaction time to be able to get, get away. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And, it, you know, the whole thing with, um, I think with these creatures, I think what's going to be their demise is – Food or curiosity, one of these two things are going to catch up with this creature. It's going to be either leaving, and I don't mean leaving out food, like it's going to take a Randy Harrington to figure out a way to leave food for them to realize it's not a trap. I think if you just randomly leave out food, I don't think these things are like a grizzly bear. They're just going to come in and help themselves. I think because you hear about them opening coolers, or coolers you hear them about them. Uh, people put their their food up in uh, bear bags and they hang them from trees. And these things are uh, – there was an encounter I just posted on the blog where this guy unzipped his tent, looked out, and there's two of them. And they looked like they were talking to each other trying to figure it. And he said it looked like uh, – the only thing he could relate it to, it looked like two big, huge, hairy men 
having a discussion on how they're going to get this food out of the tree. Um, so I think food and curiosity is going to catch them. One day is going to catch them. Yep. Yep. Had a lot of interesting things happen. So, yeah, I mean, just we just seem to be on the just on the cusp of 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 a great discovery. We just got to stick to it. And, uh, of course, let technology keep improving because, you know, technology is taking us a long way over the last few years. So, you know, we'll just let that keep working. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you coming on, Randy, and sharing your audio and sharing what happened to you. I can't wait to see the uh, thermal. If it uh, does get released, please let me know. I'll release it to the audience so they can see it. And as always, Randy, I you know, I, I, I think the world of you. And uh, I'm so happy that you came back. Thank you so much for coming back on the show. Well, hey, uh, the first weekend in October, we're going back for another five days on that on that property. So hopefully we'll have another stretch of good things. Absolutely. Thanks again, Randy. All right. Bye-bye.